Hello, everyone. Very loud there. Welcome to the Evening Standard Stories Festival in association with Netflix. I'm sure you've heard of them. I'm delighted to be hosting the Q&A for today, and I'm delighted to introduce Holly Smale. Give her a round of applause. Hey. <laughs> Elle McNichol and Abigail Bow. And as you may be aware, I think the subtitle of this is Young, Geeky and Gifted. <laughs> <laughs> whether, whether we agree with that title or not, we can talk about <laughs> later. Certainly not young. So I'm sure each person doesn't need an introduction, but I will do a very small introduction anyway. These three amazing people are authors. They are children's authors at the moment and young adult, but who knows what can happen. Um, I will start with Holly. Holly Smale is... The rather successful author, I think 3.5 million copies you may have sold of the Geek Girl series. There is also the Valentine series as well, which is out. And Geek Co Girl has also been translated into 29 languages. <laughs> how many languages are there? How many more have we got to go? Quite we lot. can probably do this. <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> a lot, but 29 <laughs> is fairly, fairly impressive. Also, I think at your debut, you won the 2014 Waterstone Children's Book of the Year. Teen section, yeah. In the teen section. Um, Geek Girl features, as you may be aware, a protagonist called Harriet Manners. Of course she's called Harriet Manners. <laughs> it's one of those things. I, well, I will ask you about it at some mm. point. But one of those things is, of course, that makes sense. She likes science. She likes facts. She falls over a lot and gets into scrape, and she accidentally becomes a model, which is quite, I mean, as a combination, and I think that's one of the reasons why it works. There's a lot of counterintuitiveness going in there. Something you go, huh? And then you go, of course. Um, so welcome, Holly. Thank you. It's lovely to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, more applause. That's just applause. Elle McNichol. I've got you on there, but you're sitting there. But yeah, if you see it's not <laughs> in order. Is an author living in London and a writer. Her debut, A Kind of Spark, uh, won the overall winner of the Waterstones Children's Book Prize 2021, I believe. Yep, it was a few months ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It was also Blackwell's Children's Book of the Month in June. Yeah. And your new book is out already, isn't it? Show us who you are. Yes. Yes. Um, it features a protagonist again who... You know, it's, it's <laughs> what we say. she is out and out autistic in this book. Yeah. Neurodiverse, it's a book that's explicitly about neurodiversity, and that's sort of what we're here to talk about anyway. Um, Addy lives in a small Scottish village. She has a fascination for sharks, which got me at the first. Oh, oh my, <laughs> you, you know, we really want to read about protagonists who like sharks first off and then <laughs> see where it goes. Um, not many people understand her. There's a very nice librarian in there. One day, in her school, one day during a history lesson, she discovers that her small town once executed women for the crime of being witchcraft, which witch, witches, and the crime of witchcraft. So it becomes an immediate obsession for Addie and something that she feels she needs to uncover more of, learns more about the city and herself, and hopefully some justice is done. <laughs> In a way, it can Spoiler be alert. <laughs> yeah, I'm not trying not to speak too much away. So that's Elle. And in the middle, we have Abigail Balf. Hello. Who is a Brighton-based writer, illustrator, and you're an Emmy Award-winning creative producer as oh well, yes. Abigail. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Her debut is slightly different because it's non-fiction, and the rest are fiction here. Um, it's a different sort of normal, and it was out, was it June or July? July 22nd. My favourite number. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> July the 22nd of this year. It's about growing up and feeling out of place. It's Puffin's children's non-fiction title of the year, this year. Um, and Abigail also used to perform stand-up comedy and cause mischief with Little Mix's social media account once, if she is going to talk about that later. Oh dear, where's this going on in? <laughs> 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 um, but that's a matter entirely. I see... And you can tell me off for being wrong. I see a different sort of normal as a kind of travel guide. Oh. <laughs> so the planet that is yeah. your planet, but also that is shared with other people. And you don't all live in the same street, in a way. Yeah. Look at me running with this. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's a good metaphor. Yeah. And the contents page is like a map. Yes. So it goes into different places. and Yeah. Yeah. And so in that sense, it's different. But 
in other senses, it's, there is such a common thread, and this is what we're here to discuss with your book and the three authors here. Um, I also, just as a side note, was really excited to find someone else who uses the Make Your Own Calligraphy uh, website, um, which Abigail used for her book. So some of it looks handwritten. It looks very much... This is it to sow your vision and what you wanted it to be with your illustrations in it as well. Um, you know, it ties it in all together. So welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, there are other gongs and all sorts of awards they've won, but I mean, we'd be here all day if we talked about that. So we're obviously talking about neurodiversity, neuro can't even say it, and writing. Um, and we, we were discussing this before, and they're saying maybe it is like a planet where we all live nearby, but not on the same street. Maybe it's like having a cold where you may have something, but you don't experience it the same way as anyone else. But for sure, I think the first thing to note is that when I was growing up, there weren't books like this. There was nothing to say that if you felt odd, out of place, weird, you did stupid things or said stupid things or just couldn't quite fit in. There was a sort of place you could go, but there was always a happy ending or girls had to like ballet to, to kind of <laughs> push it into a different direction. It just wasn't this stuff. And that's what I think is so incredible. And also so incredible, I've been reading the books this week, sort of as a whole, and wanted to see how they fitted together. So, I mean, who shall I start with? I mean, I'll start with you, Holly. Don't look too terrified. But I'm presuming this stuff wasn't around um, when you grew up. But also, your story is slightly different in that you found out about your own neurodiversity after you've written The Geek Girl novels. Yeah, so I was diagnosed last year um, at the age of 30. I told the newspaper 39 and then I realised I was three weeks before my birthday, so I was actually 38. <laughs> so I lied. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I only realised last year um, when I was diagnosed, So it, and that took about six months to get the diagnosis, so it's been about a year and a bit for me. Um, and then obviously before that, I'd spent 10 years writing the Geek Girl series, mm. where um, it is about Harriet, and essentially the story is about her neurodivergency. Like, I didn't realise that she was autistic. I didn't know there was a word for it. Mm. I just knew that my experience growing up had been different to, A, the majority of people's experiences growing up, but also that, that there weren't any books that I could find, um, especially growing up, but even... I mean, I started writing Geek Girl in 2009, so, you know, there, there wasn't anything out there, and mm. I just needed... It was a compulsive need to get a voice, to write a voice that I, I was desperately seeking, um, and also just, like, therapy. I needed to work through a lot of trauma, <laughs> like... Um, and I had no idea that, you know, I was like, well, I'm writing this character who, you know, is, like, socially inept, um, doesn't completely understand the world around her, um, is constantly being pulled apart by everybody, um, is, you know, struggles with various kind of with everything essentially both inside and outside um and i want to write about what it's like to navigate the world i did not know there was a word for that called autism <laughs> um so i wrote for 10 years about this character um and it was only with my diagnosis i was like oh and actually i had spent 10 years of people going is harry autistic and oh, okay. Because she is. She's so very, very clearly autistic. Like, she ticks every box. Yeah. And so I'd spent 10 years with people going, um, <laughs> is, is Harry autistic? And me going, no, because I'm not, and she's based on me, so can't be. Um, I even had the National Autistic Society messaging me and saying, wow. we think Harriet's autistic. Have you considered looking at that as an option? <laughs> and I was like, they were like, can we take Harriet as one of our, you know, uh, our people mm. that we can... Mm. And I was very rude. <laughs> I was like, no, you cannot. I am not, so I don't really uh, think it's appropriate to be asking me these things. So yeah, I pushed back really hard. And I partly, and we'll get on to talking about it, I'm sure, but I partly pushed back because I had no idea what autism was. Mm -hmm. I did not recognize myself in the autistic boys that were on t TV. Mm -hmm. um, I had swallowed the myths about lack of empathy and inability to make eye contact and um, just general brokenness. Um, and I didn't either see myself or want to see myself. So I pushed back on it. Mm. And it took until I was 38 years old to get a diagnosis. So yeah, my journey is quite different. I was writing about it before I knew. <laughs> yeah, but that's what makes it so easy is we're talking about one subject. Everybody has a completely different experience yes, of it. You know, exactly. there's, there's no one thing. I mean, Al, you were diagnosed, were you I, I was diagnosed with a learning difficulty first. There right. was a gap between the diagnosis, but I was a young adult. Mm. And I being introduced in neurodiversity at the age of nine, and getting pulled out of classrooms in front of your peers to go and have a special education class. And, and exactly like Holly said, 
not, I mean, I had a, 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 these labels, but I didn't know what they meant. I didn't know what they meant in the context of myself. I, I just thought it was something boys had. And, and when I would go to these special classes, it was all boys there. I was the only girl. And that was, that's really demoralizing. It makes you feel very, yeah. So it was a very negative experience for a long time. And I didn't talk about it. I had a complete, I don't want to bring the mood down, but <laughs> I had a difficult time in my 20s because I just didn't tell people about it. And I masked and, and I tried to be a, a good neurotypical and it failed miserably. And then I finally sat down to write and I found myself writing about Addy and found, and her sister Kidi, Addy has an older sister who's mm -hmm. also autistic and she's very different to Addy. She's very glamorous and she's very um, opinionated and loud where Addy's quite introverted and, and nice. And I just explored everything with the two of them, like very like therapy, like Holly says. And, and um, it is about witch trials, but it was also a little bit of kind of reordering childhood and kind of giving this young character, this 11-year-old character, a vocabulary and a, a confidence that I didn't have. Mm. And yeah, everyone's story is very different. Mm. Mm. But it's, it's a journey and it took a long time to be able to say, I still sometimes, when I talk about being neurodivergent, there's a voice in my head that's like, shut up, like stop telling people that. Because I remember when I was younger being told, don't think that you'll get special treatment. Don't tell people about this. Keep it quiet. Mm. Don't talk about it. Nobody wants to hear it. And and I believed them, mm. and it was a long time before I was able to write about it and talk about it. So, are you saying that school support was actually just a bit patchy? <laughs> well, we are being filmed, <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, I had probably more support than a lot. I mean, the support for girls who are neurodivergent and the support for people of color who are neurodivergent mm. and people on low income is. Mm astronomically poor mm. our understanding of what autistic is is still very narrow mm. and i i got a little bit of support but nothing that um i think sometimes there's an idea that if you you get diagnosed young you have this this playbook for life and you just know everything and i didn't nobody told me what it was no i remember doing tests in a hospital but nobody said what they were looking for and nobody said this is what you are and this is what it means they just told my my family and I never had that conversation. So I'm kind of with a kind of spark. The last thing I want to do is write a book that is going to bore people to tears. <laughs> I don't want to write about the, the education of autism, anything like that. Mm -hmm. But there's bits and pieces peppered in that mm -hmm. I think, you know, if a neurodivergent child reads this, or yeah. any child, I hope that they pick these things up and go, oh, that's why I have trouble with loud noises or, or busy classrooms or fire alarms. Or that's why I have difficulty when I've been going through a lot all day and I get home and I just can't speak. I hope that they pick those things up and realize mm. that's your neurology, that's your neurotype. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with that. You shouldn't ever feel like you're a bad version of your peers because you are different. Mm. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dodge that question a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was beautifully <laughs> done. And Abigail, yeah. you got your um, diagnosis um, in your 30s, I believe. So you did, I mean, like Holly, there's uh, quite a lot of time of, I would presume, self-doubt and yeah. uncertainty. Well, yeah, I suppose, because I always, I grew up kind of thinking I was just weird, I didn't fit in, didn't feel like any of the people around me at school, People called me freak and scratched it into my pencil tin as well. Me too. Why do they always do that? Yeah. Yeah, but they're watching now and they're going to be so <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there were the occasional mentions of autism. Like my brother once said to my mum, by the way, mum, Abby's autistic. And <laughs> my mum said, oh, stop it. No, she's not. She's just a bit creative. She's just got the creative gene. Um, because my mum didn't know anything about autism, mm. and neither did I. I thought he was trying to insult me because I didn't know anything about autism, and I think maybe he was trying to insult me. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there were occasional mentions of it, but I just kind of brushed it off. And, and when I was doing stand-up comedy, even I ended up, like, because when you do stand-up, you're kind of taught... Um, when you first go on stage, bring attention to what the audience is going to notice about you. So because people had been saying, oh, maybe, maybe you're autistic, I thought, okay, I'm going to have to bring this up on stage then. And then I was just making jokes out of it, not having a clue that I actually was autistic. Um, and, yeah, um, 
then how did the diagnosis happen? Oh, there were kind of uh, various things. Um, so I started an MA in children's book illustration. And being back in the classroom after all those years kind of sparked memories of the overwhelming sensory uh, aspects of it. Um, the like the feeling of when the teacher says, get in a group of four and discuss. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> and then <laughs> you're feeling. Oh, it's coming back. Flashbacks. <laughs> um, and the thing is like, right, we're now we're doing a group crit and you have to stay in the classroom and sit in this seat for like the whole day. And I'm like, how, how do I do this? And like, try to act normal. And like, yeah, so that was going on. And also, I decided to give up alcohol because um, I'd kind of thought that I was hung over all of the time, even though I wasn't drinking excessively. But um, say if I'd get drunk at the weekend um, and by Wednesday, I would still be feeling kind of weird. I think, oh, I must be really sensitive to alcohol and I will need to give it up. Um, so I stopped drinking and at first anxiety did reduce. Um, but after a few weeks, I noticed that the things that I expected to disappear were actually still there. Um, and what I realized was it was autism sensory overload things, like about the bright lights and feeling overwhelmed in group situations, not being able to contribute to back and forth conversations in a group situation, like feeling anxious on public transport and with the sounds and the overlapping things and bright lights and all of this stuff that I thought was residual alcohol stuff was actually autism. And I started looking into it because um, a couple of my friends were diagnosed as autistic in their late 20s and 30s. And I thought, we're really similar and we've always gone really well and everyone has called us weird and hmm. Uh, then I did some research, lots of research, YouTube, Instagram, <laughs> blogs, basically everything. Autism became my special interest, and I didn't know what a special interest was back then. Um, and then, yeah, um, I decided, hmm, maybe autism is the answer. And then I decided, actually, it's definitely the answer. So I went to the doctor with a big list, because... Uh, Apparently, autistic people like lists. <laughs> Stereotype, but also true, because for me anyway. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> um, and I didn't even get through the list. She was like, okay, great. <laughs> yeah, we'll refer you. Mm. And then long process because of the NHS. Yeah. Um, took about a year and eight months, I think it was, from initial GP to lots of various assessments. And while the process was happening, I wrote a blog saying um, I'm writing this from the past because when you read this I will have been diagnosed as autistic and I thought better get a head start on this because uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll need to post it when the diagnosis happens um, wait what was the question <laughs> <laughs> um, when you got your diagnosis oh uh, yeah <laughs> when I was 33 and it was a very happy day I was very relieved and yeah of course, so you've got celebrate. the box ticked. Yeah. I mean, how important is it? Because obviously there must be, I say obviously, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, there must be a thing of what if I am, but also what if I'm not? Yeah. For each of you, was it really, really important to have that down as, I mean, I am either yes or no? Elle. I think it is quite important. But like I say, when I got my, yeah, I, I just didn't know what to do with the information. Mm. But... The thing about diagnosis is that the community, uh, w it's interesting, everyone has said the same thing and they've said, we didn't know what autism was. Mm. And that's kind of, m most people don't know what autism <laughs> is and society doesn't understand autism for what it can be. And so I think there's so many people that will never get a diagnosis because mm. people think, no, they can't, that they're, they're not the type. And mm. it's quite sad. So I, I, I don't, tell my readers that a diagnosis is vital and that you are not in this community if you don't have one because so many people I think are, are it's a privilege to have one mm. so um but I think it absolutely is especially for people who are maybe late diagnosed it's so important to have that that moment of explanation to go actually I can help make sense of the last 20 30 years mm. I think it is important 
I mean, I was broken by the time I got my diagnosis. I was a complete mess. I mean, I know that mental health um, for um, autistic people is in pan anyway, um, but that is especially high if you're undiagnosed. And I genuinely, by the time, I mean, I'm talking <coughs> eating disorders, serious depression, anxiety, breakdowns, the whole lot by the time I was in my late 30s. And I genuinely, I started therapy four years ago, so before my diagnosis. And on the first session I walked in and I said, she said, okay, what are we gonna look at and what do you want? And I went, I need to know why I'm broken. And I need to know how, I'm, how to fix me. And, you know, it was amazing, actually, because last weekend I went, I don't think I'm actually broken. And the diagnosis is what made the difference because I suddenly understood that t my brain worked differently and it always had, and I experienced the world differently and I always had. There was nothing wrong with me. Um, in fact, there was many, many right things about me. And that instead of constantly trying to mask, and I was exhausted with masking because I'm a really good masker, and if I put my mind to it, I can pass as neurotypical mm. easily. Mm. Um, and it was exhausting me. It was completely wiping me out. And I'd just become a hermit because I was like, I can't, I can't keep doing this. Um, and the diagnosis is what made the shift for me. Mm. And I, like um, Abby, went down the rabbit hole of, you know, pushing back on this idea of autism for many years. Mm. Never at school because I was too clever to be autistic mm. when I was little, mm. um, which well is bonkers, yeah. bonkers. But anyway, I was also a girl, um, you know. And that's what we haven't said and I did want to pick up, if you want to pick up on that, about the underdiagnosis of girls and women. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not going to go into the... I would love to go into it because, you know, obviously it's <laughs> incredibly it's interesting, but I won't for time purposes. <laughs> but the history of autism is something that lot, not a lot of people know about, and it was, um, you know, if dark as hell, inaccurate as hell, like, you know, we're talking Nazis, Austria, the whole malarkey, but it was focused on boys. Mm. And so, you know, rather than looking at autism and going, what patterns are we seeing? They were like, let's look at these boys and then make patterns out of those. So essentially, you know, there was a really good analogy of someone shooting a gun at, at a wall and then looking for where the most of the marks are and just drawing the bullseye around that. Mm. <laughs> You're like, that's not how a bullseye works. Um, so it was focused on boys. It was focused on white boys. Mm. And so it, it missed anyone who wasn't that. And essentially, um, those, those scientists for 100 years just kept focusing on that, kept going in on it. You know, even, even you know, um, Simon Baron Cohen, Still going on the extreme male mind, the uh, theory of mind, the you know mass geniuses, Hans Asperger's little professors, all of that. It's all about am I, am I a white boy who is very good at maths and physics? And I was none of those things. So you know I was very arty. I was creative like these two. I was you know I was always writing and thinking up stories, and it just didn't fit the model. So it never never got picked up on when I was younger. Mm. Um, Actually, that's a lie that it did get picked up on, but my mum's also autistic, so she didn't pick up on the hints that I was autistic. Um, <coughs> so, you know, getting to the age of 38 and believing that you are a broken neurotypical person and then discovering that actually you're a perfect neurodivergent person mm -hmm. is life-changing. Mm -hmm. And the last year has been revelatory, revelatory, um, because it's reframing how I see myself and how I see the world. And that is something that, you know, years and years of therapy can't quite do if you don't know who you are. Mm. We were saying that two of you write fiction, and Abigail's book is non-fiction. Looking at children's fiction, neuro neurodiversity, see, I can't say that, so just have a look at that. Um, is, is, you know, it's around, it's present, it's not like it was, but it's coming to the fore a bit more. But in adult fiction, there doesn't seem to be much, it's usually non-fiction. Um, is it easy to write about, because it seems to be, and I don't want to use the word cathartic, but I've just used the word cathartic, that it is part of the process for you two is writing fiction around something to process what you're going through. Well, I... Is that easy? Is that hard? Is it... It's, uh, all writing can be hard, yeah. but <laughs> we all... But, yeah. but it is... Ha the hardest thing about writing, the hardest thing about writing a kind of spark, it felt so easy and natural to be accessing this lens mm. unapologetically for the first time in my life to go, I'm not going to tell myself a neurotypical person wouldn't say this, I'm just going to turn that sensor off and write it. But the hard part was then going, am I the only one that feels this? Am I... Is this putting a lot of vulnerability out? A kind of spark is not a memoir, it's not autobiographical, but the lens is authentic, it's my lens. And I thought, gosh, what if I'm so off the mark? Or what if all the other autistics gather around and go, you got it, and you're wrong. We're right, you're wrong. We're the real, you're the, we're the real ones, you're the bad one. <laughs> I mean, I have that nightmare every night. Yeah. But, um, but that's why the response was so incredible when people said, no, this is me, this is my daughter, this is me, this is my mum, it was so great. But that fear is real. and. Um, the thing about children's fiction, I did a lot of research. 
autistic people like to research. Mm -hmm. And I did a, a thesis on neurodiversity representation in kids publishing mm -hmm. and how bad it was and how what we were seeing a lot of was um, when things were specifically about autism, they were always, always written by neurotypical people. I mean, books that say, like, this is about, you know, autistic characters. Oh, right? OK. Um, and they're almost always written by neurotypicals. And there was the same story coming up again and again, which was there's a neurotypical narrator and their brother or sister is autistic and it's really hard and it's really traumatic and tragic and they have a difficult life because their sibling is disabled and I hate reading those books I hate it mm -hmm. and I was picking them up for this thesis and reading them and putting them down and going I feel terrible I can't imagine how a child would feel to read this about themselves or their sibling and it was just the neurotypical gaze over and over again and I kind of spark kind of came from a place of rage because I said we need stories about us by us mm. and and um and they need to be fun and have humor and and be unapologetic and um <laughs> and it's quite it's when when you know when Holly says I'm a perfect neurodivergent you can't imagine how radical a statement that feels to say sometimes mm. and you know if I if we say things like that on Twitter we get you know we get an avalanche of people going like how could you say that you are broken you are this and yeah. you know I wake up every morning to anti-vaxxers in my <laughs> messages people are like it's called a disorder yeah so like, it's, you in have the, a it's in the title they're like you have You're a like disease <laughs> and it's just like <laughs> and it's actually quite radical every day to go mm -hmm. I do not they do not mm -hmm. my readers do not and I'm sick of like playing this narrative anymore like it's done so mm -hmm. children's fiction still has a long way to go yeah. and um, Absolutely. I think, I mean I'm not talking about my own work but we've got two of the best here and there needs to be more own voices uh, in children in YA, mm. I feel. And mm. an adult because yeah. Yeah. where are they? Where are they? Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, I'm sorry but most of them, I was talking to an agent, my agent, and she was like, oh I'm not even going to name them actually because I don't want to be put, there's a few books that are either coded autistic or are absolutely outwardly autistic that are adult fiction and are well known and none of them are written by autistic people, they're always written by neurotypical people and you're like, they're like, we did research and you're like, oh did you, did you walk <laughs> around in the brain and body of an autistic person for 40 <laughs> years because otherwise that's not good mm. enough. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's huge like absence of actual genuine voices um, mm. which we need. And as we know, if you're not autistic, you're alistic. So yes. we're allowed to say alistic. There is a word. <laughs> there are words for everything, but it doesn't get banded around half as much. Abigail, did you feel exposed in any way at points? Because you're actually writing about you, really, aren't yeah. you? It is your story. <laughs> cartoons of you in it as well. It's about a lot of the concerns that you had, and toilets are <laughs> quite prominent in things, Plenty but also the little. joy and everything else. It, it's it's everything. It's your whole world. And my toilet broke while I was writing that chapter and I thought, oh, I've attracted mm. it to myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was just some man in my bathroom like playing around with some hose and <laughs> Oh, actually, I don't, I don't want to get too Don't graphic. go there, don't <laughs> go there. No, no, no. But, but how <laughs> was it writing about yourself? Because that is the, hi hello world, here I am. You're not cloaked in fiction at all for that. Yeah, I think, well, I've always found it easier to write about myself than to write fiction because I know I know me. So uh, it, it feels kind of like my writing style is sort of rambly, like how my talking is. So I just have the page and, and then I think of stuff and then I just keep writing and then it goes off into side notes and footnotes and then little drawings. Mm. And I'm with the question about... Ex yes, it was feeling exposed, but I was going to yeah. say, you did stand-up comedy, yeah. and I think that, to me, sounds like the most hello world, here I am, old Well, this, the thing is, I always found stand-up comedy a lot easier than I did like doing work meetings, and I feel like autistic people can be, well, I know I am good at monologuing on things that I know about, and if I've got a script and um, I know the subject well, then I can run with it. So getting up on stage, um, audience are there and they're not, well, they're not supposed to answer back. Sometimes they do heckle, but I put them in their place. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, having, having the platform to just talk, but then when you're in a work meeting, you've got the back and forth and then you can't prepare for what someone else is going to say or the environment of the room and, um, so I found, yeah, 
being on that's stage worse. easier than the, the meetings are worse. Being on stage is easier and writing work life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that most of you have done school visits, signings, those sorts of things. Who are your readers, and what kind of response do you are you getting out? I could talk about that for hours. I'm going to try not to get emotional, but um, you can get my <laughs> my readers are usually uh, you know I'm right middle grade, um, so they're usually eight and up. Mm -hmm. But I have a ton of adult readers as well as children, and for for all the horrible messages you get for being openly ND online, you get these essays that people send saying this is the first time I've seen myself in fiction, you know. Um, I get, I'm getting a diagnosis because of this book. I gave my doctor this book. That's incredible. And then I hear from them six months later and they've got it. And it's just such, that's a thrill. My readers are, for children, are very young, very intelligent, very sensitive, sweet kids. And a lot of them are ND. And what's so great about them is that they're totally fine. That they're, they get up in front of their classmates and they say, I'm autistic. And I just look at that and I'm just like, wow, mm -hmm. that is, that is, that's a big difference in 20 years already. Mm -hmm. um, and they 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 love what's great about the kids is they love the the sisters fighting and they love the witch trial the history and in my second book they love the AI and the science fiction mm. and it's all the adults that are like why are these books important and <laughs> the kids are just like oh I love when they like <laughs> punched her in the face and, um, <laughs> yes. so yeah they're they're the best um, I'm not gonna start crying on stage but they're the best. <laughs> and Holly, you've had a different experience, obviously, because of the diagnosis after. Have you had a different reaction from your readers? I've only done one school visit since I've been diagnosed, mm -hmm. um, and that was interesting because I brought um, autism into the speech that I do, um, and that made it quite a different talk. And mm. actually, they were really interested. I thought that it was going to go down differently, but it, they were fascinated, and all the questions at the end were about autism, which was really interesting. But I've been doing the job for a decade, so I've been talking to hundreds and hundreds of schools, thousands of I mean, sometimes I've done stage events with a thousand students in the room, um, which, as Abby said, is actually fine, because I just monologue, and then I get to the end and go, okay, right, <laughs> it's quite nice to be able to talk for an hour and no one yeah. interrupts. But anyway, um, so I, you know, I'm, but what's interesting about my books is that because um, Geek Girl is autistic, but she wasn't diagnosed, so yeah. she wasn't out with the autistic. Um, and it's got, you know, she's geeky, but, you know, that's you can be a geek without being autistic. Mm. Um, and also because she's a model. Um, so it kind of brings that fashion element into it. And it's a comedy. Mm. So, you know, you've got all these, it means that, obviously, you know, three and a half million books sold, there are not three and a half million autistic children buying it. So it must have had a wide readership, right? And everyone was connecting with different things, which was really interesting. So I had a lot of, like, very sensitive outsider children reading it and coming mm. up to me and going, I feel like this is me. But I always had a lot of children who, ironically, would probably have been the ones bullying me at school who were loving it. Right. And I actually got a tweet today say it from someone saying, um, I always thought Harriet was autistic, but every time I told them, my friends and family, that she was autistic, they said, no, she's too clever to be autistic, which is the sort of shit you hear. Sorry, mm. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. <laughs> the sort of shit you hear. Um, but, um, but also, you know, she said that the girls at school who loved your books were the ones picking on me for being exactly like Harriet. So there's an irony there, you know? It's mm. like, because she was popular for being quirky, but not outwardly labelled autistic... It, 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 I was kind of winning from not labelling it in a way, but also kind of not winning for being seen as, oh, it's, di yeah. Yeah. I've lost. My I understand what you mean. It's double edged, isn't it? It's sort of a Trojan horse. Yeah, but it's lovely now to be able to talk about it. And that was one of the yeah. reasons that I wanted to be open about my diagnosis, mm. was because so many people had loved Harriet and s she felt like a real person to so many people. It felt like a really powerful statement to be able to say, you loved this girl. You followed this girl for mm. 10 books. Mm. You, you know, followed her for a decade. She's autistic. So if that's how, you know, how do you look at autism? How do you feel about autistic people now, now that you know? And I felt that was powerful enough to handle Twitter trolls. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you've widened the conversation. Yeah. And I think we can say that Twitter trolls don't widen the conversation. No, they no, they do not. <laughs> and Abigail. What's been the reaction to to your user's guide? <laughs> um, well, my book's only been out since July, but um, yeah, it's been really amazing to see. To see, to see yeah, to see. I've had loads of messages from l lots of adults saying that they originally bought the, the book for their child, but through reading it, they've learned about themselves, and now they've realised why they felt different all of their lives, and they've been saying thank you for opening my eyes to it and um there have been people saying that they're now 
waiting for, they've got the courage to go to the doctor to, as adults to mm -hmm. get a diagnosis. And although the, the book was originally um, aimed at 8+, plus, um, but it's, the, it's reached a lot of adults who are, yeah, who, yeah, yeah, why. and, wait, what's I going to say? Oh, but I haven't, yeah, because I haven't done any school visits yet because it's only because been out. Yeah, but yeah. Um, I've got uh, a Puffin virtual school visit coming up on the 15th of October, 10.30 in the morning, so uh, schools can sign up to it. <laughs> it's also um, something, and, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, I know you two fiction girls, you you stand like you, you you know you do very well, but I can imagine Abigail your book as a Netflix graphic novel series. I can imagine it just coming out like that because of wow. the kind of book it is that it it also <laughs> has it can widen the conversation in that way. Yeah, yeah. It's open there to to widen it. It's just mm, important exactly. to show different representations exactly. because yes. we we all have the same type. We different. have different stories. We yes. have different yeah. ways of writing. We have different personalities. You know, yeah. it's not we're not. You don't even have though you've all dressed the same by accident. <laughs> we didn't, we didn't <laughs> arrange this. <laughs> I did not mean to dye my hair to match um, Abby's trousers. <laughs> but it is beautiful. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> what inspired you growing up? So can you now see books that you like, for instance, that, that had characters that actually do display some neurotypical signs, Elle? Um, I loved Jill Barch from Little Women. I think mm -hmm. there's maybe a little bit... I mean... Sometimes I hear myself talking at school visits and I'll be like, if there's a character that has a personality and they're really <laughs> smart, they're probably ND. And then I'm like, oh no, that's maybe insulting to all the, <laughs> the non-ND people. Mm. But um, <coughs> for me, it was much more film and TV that was coded in that way. Right. Um, so a lot of Disney films, I feel, are very ND coded. So yeah. Lilo from Lilo and Stitch and Elsa. Elsa, oh, very much so, really? yeah. Um, I mean, every Disney character in the 90s was like an outcast and the community would be like, they're so strange, <laughs> this main character, they're so weird. And I would be at home like, yes, yes, I know that. So it was much more film and TV for me. And the books I, I read, I just, I think I was very literal minded and I needed to see the word. And, um, and, and then one day a book had the word and I went, oh, that's not me at all. They must have been wrong about me. <laughs> um, and that's just, that's why it's so dangerous to have the single story and to have just yeah. one one voice. That's why we need so many voices so that people can, you know, grasp onto, oh, that's that's more like me. I'm more creative than STEM. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. I don't love trains as much as people say I should, mm -hmm. um, yes. which has always been yes, my you don't thing. have to love trains. <laughs> like that's <laughs> one of the things. <laughs> but yeah, um, so it's film and TV for me, really. Mm -hmm. Abigail? Well... I'm 36, so when I was growing up, there weren't any... Uh, li there there were. You missed them, but they were there. Lisa there Simpson. <coughs> Lisa Simpson <coughs> is autistic. 100% autistic. That is true. I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> She's 100%... Anyway, carry on. I'm going to um, let you finish. But, um, <laughs> I was just... I was reading books about um, girls who were straight and had boyfriends mm -hmm. and went to parties and... I would just think, oh, one day when I, because I had quite a high reading age, as they, they used to say when I was at school. So when I was 12 or something, I'd be reading books that were aimed at 16-year-olds. So I was reading about people who were um, 16 and getting boyfriends and having parties. And I, and I thought, this, yes, one day I'm going to feel normal and I'm going to be like these girls. Um, so I was absorbing all of these books that were nothing to do with how I felt and nothing to do with my life. And I was just thinking that's what I should feel like. So one day I would be normal. <laughs> and yeah. This destination so point now. you were promised that you were never going to get to mm. because of what was in representation. Yeah. We never get there. I never got there. Well, it doesn't exist. No. The no. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. I don't think I'll ever feel like an adult. So well, people still like feel the 80, the and sometimes yeah. I feel 12, but never the, the bit in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I used to pitch story ideas, and people yeah. in the publishing industry were like, um, a real person wouldn't react, respond that <laughs> a way. Real or, or, you know, like a <laughs> exactly, like, like, uh, or they wouldn't, they wouldn't behave like that, or mm. they'd be the different age for that, what they're doing there, mm. or that's no, not realistic for whatever, you know, kind of, and I'm like, 
and it, it's it's really weird how those microaggressions can really like sink in yeah, because yeah. every time they did it, I'd be like, I'm not a real person. I'm not, mm. you know, I'm not, I mean, I'm still not. I'm nearly 40. I live alone. I don't have a partner. I don't have children. I don't intend to have any. Like, you know, I'm still very much, um, you know, I'm not living the life of most people my age. And every time I come up with an idea and they're like, wow, that wouldn't happen to someone that age. Or so you're like, oh my God, I'm just reminded all over again that I do not think or live the way that most people mm. do. But back to the TV and thingy, Lisa Simpson. Yeah. So well, Lisa Simpson um, and Anne of Green Gables, they were my two, my two, the two loves of my young mm. life. Um, Definitely. Both of them were autistic. Mm. Um, and Lisa Simpson is so, I mean, I'm a, I've actually been like kind of slightly trolling and harassing um, the Simpsons TV show in, in America to try and get them to make Lisa openly autistic because they did an episode on ADHD with Bart, right? That's right. Yeah. So why would they not then do one on autism for for Lisa? Can I ask a follow up question? Did you mm. get back in touch with the Autism Society after your? Uh, yeah, yeah. Cover yeah. girl. Yeah, <laughs> I was on the cover of their ah. last magazine. So yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that was a bit of a um, a one eighty. But anyway. Um, but Lisa was me. So I was Lisa when I was younger. Mm. And um, I was called Lisa by my friends and family. Um, I didn't have any friends, but family used to <laughs> call me Lisa. Um, and, you know, right down to the to the earnest monologuing and mm. the special interests and the no friends and mm. the, you know, like, just, she rocks. She literally rocks. Like, someone, when I posted about it on Twitter, you've always got some people going, wow, why isn't she just a really clever neurotypical? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sure they speak like that. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Um, they all speak like that. They all in my head speak <laughs> like that. Um, and they were like, she doesn't even stim. So I literally found a gif in about three <laughs> seconds of her stimming. Mm. She's literally sitting there going like this. Mm. And I'm like, there you go, there's one. One out of many, many. Like, she is so very definitely autistic and the difference that her open diagnosis would have made to me personally yeah. is that being called Lisa by my friends and family so family um <laughs> I I would m have been diagnosed because when I told my dad who was trying who was kind of he's neurotypical he was trying to get his head around the whole autism thing what is it what does it mean etc etc and I was like Lisa Simpson is autistic and my dad was like oh yeah no if we'd known that we'd definitely have known you were <laughs> So it would have changed my life, mm. which is why I keep harassing, you know, the writers mm. on The Simpsons because I'm like, can you the life changing difference it would have made? Mm -hmm. So yeah, we were we, there were a few just around, but they were never out. They were never actually diagnosed, and that would have made a difference. Mm -hmm. And Anne of Green Gables as well, so very clearly autistic. Mm -hmm. She smacks a, a chalkboard over a boy's head for calling for flirting with her, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Now I know that you get asked this a lot. If you do any schools visits, you will do. Um, but I do think it's an important question because I do think that that you need to be the inspiring women that you are. <coughs> what is your advice? Say someone's 10 or 11, they want to start writing, they want to be a writer, whether they are neurotypical or neurodivergent, what would be your one tip of advice? And it, it changes every week, I'm sure, but one um, thing that you would say to people here or watching the film? It's what I have to tell myself every time I start a new draft is to write the book that you want to read and write with your voice. The word voice gets thrown around a lot in publishing, but it really is integral because the minute you start going, well, so-and-so would say this, or people really seem to prefer that it's, you have to just write, th write what you like to read and not worry about being too clever and not worried about mm. it. It's impossible to turn that sensor off. But yeah, but I wrote Spark because I wanted to read a book when I was 11 about someone who was like me, but who wasn't this after-school special, like boring homework type character but who was f someone I could look up to and someone who was like, not glamorous but someone who you would want to be like mm. and so that's what I did I wrote the book I wanted to read I wrote the science fiction book I wanted to read so that's why I tell myself and young writers is don't worry about trying to recreate your favorite book or mm. be like someone else who you know is good write your book and your voice mm -hmm. it's the only way <laughs> someone want, did once tell me it's got your name on it Hasn't yeah. got the editor's name on it, hasn't got your friend's name on it. You're gonna carry the book. So yeah. 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 Have a go. Yeah, similar to Elle. Um, like when I was when I was at school, the I remember teachers giving me feedback saying, Yeah, good writing, but please avoid the long sentences because I think you forget what you're saying by the end when you get to the end of them. But I never did because that's the way I wanted to write. And I think don't listen to feedback yeah like people saying this is how you should write because then you're not writing like you and we need voices that are real and we don't want 
like if if we're all cop copying like rules of how you think you should write according to textbook standard writing and all of that business then you won't get the unique books and the books that people want to read and can see themselves in yeah and also you know like especially if you're neurodivergent your reactions to things your emotions to things are not going to be the same you're not going to think the same way mm. and i spent a long time trying to write a book that read like a normal person it was almost like i was masking as i was writing mm. so that's a lot of effort to be putting mm. in when you're trying to write a book um and you know it was only when i started writing geek gun and i suddenly i remember physically putting it down and just going like just putting all that expectation all that mask dropping the mask and going i'm just gonna write me i'm gonna write me and i'm gonna have fun with it and you know no one's ever gonna buy it and it will be just <laughs> my way of getting through this horrible experience i had at school mm. um and i think it's that and, and to be honest i have to remind myself of that as well you know every time i start a book i have to try and drop the mask essentially mm. i have to try and not write like a neurotypical person i have mm. to accept the fact that my character is probably going to react in ways that neurotypical people don't react. Um, you know, they're going to think in ways they don't, and that's okay, and that's a good thing. So when I'm talking to young people at any age, really, about writing, it's like, just allow yourself to be yourself, even if you're writing fiction. Even if the thing hasn't happened, allow, like, like Elle said, your voice to be genuine, because that's what you really, as a reader, that's what you pick up on. You read authenticity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, now is the time that if anyone does have a question, there are microphones that hover <gasps> magically. Like Jeremy Carl. They don't. <laughs> they're actually handed by someone very nice from Picture House. So does anyone have any questions for our amazing panel? I'm um, really please sorry don't be shy. Because <laughs> now is your chance. Ah, we haven't talked about Little Mix. If you want to ask about Little <gasps> Mix social media accounts, yes. am I allowed to? I don't know. Yeah, probably. Oh, go on. Oh, go on, man. <laughs> They're not with it. No one will. Well, in a past life, <laughs> <laughs> um, I used to run the social media for One Direction and Little Mix. And um, one day I made a mistake and um, I accidentally posted one of my comedy videos on Little Mix's page, <laughs> geo targeted to France. And. Um, uh, it had some rude words in it. <laughs> oh no, um, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> and then you did uh, it again, which is making us suspect that you didn't actually do it on that yeah. accident. Taking advantage there was of a that photo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the international manager came downstairs and said, you do realise um, uh, you've just posted a video of your stand-up comedy on Little Mix's page. It's been up there for 45 minutes. Can you take it down, please? <laughs> and, and I thought, well, it, it's good publicity I suppose if <laughs> maybe I can get some fans in France but <laughs> it didn't work out that way I checked the video didn't get any new likes I got one dislike so it was a waste of time <laughs> people thought, probably thought it was oh. some really weird new little bit video yeah the fans <laughs> were like the fans <laughs> were like, remember? what does it mean <laughs> yeah, what does yeah. It mean? it's the new analysis. journalists were all studying it inti mm. intricately oh, hints and about. once I accidentally posted a picture of my guinea pig on One Direction's account <laughs> <laughs> Got Instagram. lots of retweets though, and loads of likes. I would imagine. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the other new member, it's of good guinea pig. Yeah. Rest in peace. We must oh. have a question. Come oh. on, Monsieur. We've got a question here. Oh, we have to wait until oh. you get. Sorry, oh. just for sound reasons. I apologise. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> and I just wonder whether at the time when you were writing them, you were, um, whilst you were also having a difficult time, did you also feel a great sense of fun as well? Yes. Um, I mean, I, interesting, that's not interesting. I would say interestingly before a sentence, even though it's not <laughs> very interesting. Um, I started writing those when I was uh, 26, 27. Um, and it's always been really important to me to use humour, especially when you're dealing with so many sad topics. You know, I mean, Harriet is quite abused quite badly by the people around her, and that is definitely from direct experience. So there's a lot of pain there, and I didn't want that to be so heavy that it made it an unreadable book. So, you know, and also I think comedy is just a joy generally, and ironically it's something I had to teach myself because I didn't understand humour when I was young. But um, I ironically wrote the book, um, the beginning of the book, um, got an agent, and then my life was pretty good at that point. And then I um, went through a really nasty breakup in a different uh, in a different country, and I couldn't write because I was too sad to write comedy. 
So um, I didn't write for three years, and and then the Geek Girl books. It took it took for me to get my life back together again, for me to actually be able to write comedy. Because essentially, yeah, you're right. It is it's difficult to write humour when you're in pain. Um, and also, you know, there there was a lot of stuff that happened in Geek Girl that did actually happen to me, um, and there was a lot of catharsis and crying and pain in writing that as well. So yeah, it's difficult. It can be difficult to write comedy when it's sad topics but I do think it's important because I think it's um that if you can make the people laugh you can make them cry and that's that's kind of my motto with writing if I answer the question that answer the question <laughs> yeah. what a great answer anyone else who feels that comedy is sometimes difficult to slip in there when it's if you're talking about these real experiences I love uh, the kind of spark has lots of scenes with townspeople mm. when Addie's campaigning and it's very based on the little village in Scotland I grew up in and it's what makes people laugh the most when they read the book. Mm. But I find a lot, I felt when I was younger, people laughed at me a lot and thought I was trying to be funny when I was just being dead serious. I think that's, and people still point things out in the books and they go, that's hilarious. And I'm like, no, I'm being, <laughs> I'm being frank. That's not like, it's just an observation. Mm. So yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I, I loved putting a bit of humour into Spark and the second book for their friendship because, because well, the thing is, you get tagged a lot online where people are like, you should read this book by Elle McNichol. And, it's a, and all they say is, it's about a girl with autism, <laughs> which isn't a plot. And then <laughs> the, the other person goes, oh, that sounds too heavy. Oh, I don't know about that. And I always go, there's this idea that anything to do with autism mm. is serious and, mm. and classroomy and that we all have to like sit and be, and it's like, no, it can be fun, it's funny. Um, not all funny, but like there's lots of humor there. And um, yeah, I love, I love when people find stuff in the books funny. And, but it's difficult sometimes, uh, yeah. Um, writing middle grade is difficult because you have to not let trauma get in too much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's a difficult um, kind of road to walk sometimes because you're dealing with young people mm -hmm. um but yeah humor is great mm -hmm. one of the best things the one of the one of the things with my narrative voice is that um a lot of my comedy comes from pointing from the narrative gap between my narrator and my reader mm. so um uh, it, it, i i almost accidentally used harriet's autism to make the comedy because although it's not a case of laughing at her hopefully you're laughing with her mm her missing stuff, her not getting stuff, her misunderstanding stuff is what you, part of the comedy comes from. Mm. So in a way, you're kind of, there's a warmth there because you're kind of finding the stuff to laugh with Harriet about. We allow her to fail, which is what I yeah. really like about it. And we don't laugh at her. We're with her when she does it, which I think, and she's just so funny, which I think is really what carries it through. And it can be really Absolutely. vulnerable when you're doing yeah. it though. Like, I mean, Honest. I remember writing one scene where it was, hilariously painful where she's put in a class um, competition where there's a game that they're doing and she gets so carried away that she basically doesn't realize that everyone else has stopped playing the game and she's completely wrecked the game for everybody else and she's taken out she's answering the questions to the wrong people and a lot and everybody hates her but there's something so painfully funny about it because you know once you take a step back and you can kind of like see it with warmth and, and that narrative gap it, it there's a lot of comedy to be had essentially in the way we see the world mm. I think mm. Were there any other questions? Everyone's super shy. shy. <laughs> ah, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> it's because they know each other. Yes, it's quite well. Yes. <laughs> uh, my question is obviously for Elle. I wanted to ask, um, <laughs> was <laughs> writing the second book with an autistic protagonist much harder after the first book was received so well by the autistic community? I've been making, this is my boyfriend, I've been making, <laughs> I've been making jokes all day that he's going to ask a plan to question, I didn't ask him to ask this. Th wait, so was it harder to write hard Aura? <coughs> it was hard because, and maybe the others experience this now too, but I wrote A Kind of Spark, and A Kind of Spark did quite well. It won Blue Peter, it won Waterstones, um, it was a best settler. And then when I said I'm writing Show Us Who You Are with another autistic heroine, people went, but you've done one. <laughs> You've done it. And I said, no, I've done one in a billion. There's so many, there's a billion stories about being autistic. So I said, yeah, I'm doing another autistic heroine, bite me. And I'm doing, <laughs> and I'm doing a third one. So like, I'm just going to keep going. And there's so many different ways. So yeah, it was hard because it was hard, Josh. <laughs> it was <laughs> and you know that because you were there. Um, <laughs> but only because only people have strange views, again, about the single story and about 
you know, you can only tell one kind of story with, and it's so not true. And actually, studies show, sorry to bring up studies, but studies show that neurodivergent people are actually more different from each other than neurotypical people are. So there's so much more, when you start a new autistic character, it's a completely different ball game. You've got, yeah, you've got the, sen the same kind of diagnostic criteria which is always my own, I always go for my own lens. But then it's a whole different character and they're so different. My third heroine is rude and I love her. Mm -hmm. She's horribly rude and that's a different type of character. To so it is difficult, but only because of people's expectations. Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> Surely you must, ah oh yeah, we've got one there and one there in a minute. We have to wait for the mic. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the physical act of writing, sometimes with kind of sensory issues and sort of mm. stimming and stuff. It's something I've been struggling with recently. I do a writing, I'm starting a writing MA, and I was just sort of wondering if, if any of you experienced that or know any kind of tips, I guess, kind of to help manage that. Yeah, I, I could never write a book by hand. It's not possible. Being dyspraxic mm. as well, I, I had the humiliating pen aids that the teachers made me use. And it's, it's very exhausting. I sometimes worry when I finish a session, I go, oh God, my hands have, are in pain. Um, all I would say is um, the read aloud function on a computer has saved my life, like it's so helpful. Um, and I keep a little bit of ice, I keep a cold flannel. I mean, th this is a physical answer, but um, but yeah, no, it, it is physically, it is a lot, but um, it, if it were pen and paper, I couldn't do this job. No, That's me neither. Yeah. Yeah. Like people are like, oh, imagine being on a desert island. You could take a pen and a bit. I'm like, uh, uh, I can't write. And if it's not on a computer, that's <sighs> never going to happen. Yeah. yeah, I tried what? doing that the other day. I took a notebook to the park, started writing, but my brain was going too fast for the pen. I was like, this mm. is not working. Yeah. I used to <laughs> always try and keep diaries, and I could never do it because I would write a paragraph and go like, oh no, can't, yeah. can't do it. What I'll also say is that the thing I struggle with most from a physical perspective is the hyperfocus because when I'm hyperfocused on writing, um, I can write for 16, 17 hours straight, and it's great, I get a lot done, but it also means I don't pee, I don't drink, I don't blink, I don't eat, I don't walk, I don't literally, and I will get, I will suddenly come out of it when I'm forced to, because it's midnight or 1am, and I am unable to move, and I haven't eaten in 24 hours, mm. and, I, and I don't have, I don't live, I live alone, so there's no one sort of like, kind of say, hey, you need to kind of come out of it, um, so I'm still working on it. Like I've been writing for a decade and I'm still trying to find ways to manage that. But, you know, it's things like setting timers to make sure you have lunch, um, you know, making sure you have food in so you don't have to force yourself to go to a shop halfway through. Like it's trying to work with, because, you know, the, the, the benefit of things like hyperfocus when it comes to writing is that, you know, we have extraordinary ability to actually be in the world that we're writing. Yeah. I don't completely understand how neurotypical people write books. Like I don't completely understand it. Um, but, so we have extraordinary abilities that really lend themselves to writing novels, but they have the flip side of making ourselves sick. And if I am on a deadline and I do hyperfocus for too many days or weeks in a row, I will become very sick and I always end up with burnout at the end. Same. So try and find ways to get out of the house once a day or once a week, <laughs> pee regularly, <laughs> drink, you know. I had, I'm not lying, I have an alarm set on my phone when I'm hyper-focused that says go to the toilet. Like, it's, you know. So I think from a physical perspective, you've just got to try and take care of yourself and make sure that those things are also being catered for. Yeah, I started writing lists that have such specific things on it, like drink this particular drink at this time, prepare the coffee at this time, um, do this and it's like ri so it, like you've got something to cross off even if it's just <laughs> drinking some herbs <laughs> um, very important stay uh, hydrated yeah. as well you can forget to drink yeah, water and yeah. then you go nuts all those yeah things. and also lists I mean I structure like a mother like I am <laughs> sorry I managed to stop with that <laughs> um, <laughs> such a person um, I I, I structure, I tried to write a book. My first book I tried to write um, without a structure at all. I just winged it. I was like, hey, I'm just gonna be a winger. I'm going basically I was being lazy. I didn't want to structure it. Um, and it was a complete disaster. Like, it, I mean, my agent was like, what is this? We're, we're, what's happening? <laughs> Nothing's <laughs> happening. <laughs> like, she's like, got to the end of the book and she just had a normal day. I mean, <laughs> have you read a book before? <laughs> um, so I was like, right, okay. So I went away and I did, I, I used my ability as an autistic person to plan the hell out of my novel and now I uh, with every book I write I, pr I plan more like it gets to the point now where I spend two three months planning and I have like a 15,000 word planning document because I find that a I really enjoy it and b like it means that when I get lost in the middle mm. I've got something that I can go back to and go okay now I feel secure I feel safe I feel like I know what is happening 
And I think as autistic people, if we play to our strengths, then we can smash it because, I mean, Virginia Woolf was autistic, so it's not like we're not, you know. Yeah, make your own rules yeah. and mm. check in with yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and don't listen to advice from people that are not. <laughs> <laughs> I've stopped doing that after a few years. I'm like, what do they know? No, nothing. Well, we've got time for one more. We're on, we're on time, but we've got time for one more quick question. And there was someone over there who's now looking askance, <laughs> as if he hadn't put his. I love everyone slumping down in their seats. I like saw this. You. <laughs> Hello, this is a question for everyone. Uh, do you think there's a responsibility for neurodivergent uh, writers to talk about it, talk about their diagnosis, even if they're not writing directly about it? That's a really interesting question. I mean, we could talk about that for hours because I know a lot of middle grade writers that are autistic but do not, they're not out. Mm. And I have to okay. remember and check in with myself and go, oh, so and so is not out. I can't say that. And I don't believe so because you're a human being first. And I found, I said to my publishers when they bought a kind of spark, I said, oh, and by the way, I am neurodivergent too. And I thought the conversation would end there. And instead, newspapers wanted to talk about it. Everybody seemed to want to talk about it. And it's incredibly frightening. And you feel very, very alone because you think, oh God, now, now I'm, I'm in a box or now I'm on a box speaking for people <laughs> that I never intended to speak for. I, I think you're absolutely entitled to privacy. I feel really strongly about that now, really strongly. It's great when people do speak because we all find each other and we have a great community and it's fantastic, but absolutely people deserve to be private if they want to. Yeah, I don't think there's a responsibility. I think there's an opportunity yes. and we can, we're all people so we can take the opportunity if we want to and we can write our experiences um but everyone is everyone is a person <laughs> and yeah <laughs> yeah it took me nine months from being diagnosed to coming out um AUT -A out um <laughs> because I spent nine months in therapy mm. dealing dealing with it first of all like you know processing it took me I, I mean months just to even get my head around it I remember waking up the morning after my diagnosis and being like <laughs> like I just couldn't couldn't get my head around it um and it took me nine months to a get to process it um b learn about it as in do as much research mm. as, as, as i could so i knew what i was talking about and then c decide if this was something i wanted in my life because you know with, with when you have a profile and you know that you are if by coming out about it you are going to be not only um telling the world um but representing but also you can never take it back like i go on a yeah. date and i can't get out of it like i have to talk about it on a first date because i know that if they then home, go home and google it it's something i've hidden from yeah. them mm -hmm. um and so you're really exposed so i had to think about it really carefully and talk about it really carefully and weigh it up i wrote lists good reasons bad reasons not to talk about it or to talk about it and in the end, for me, it weighed out because I knew that if by coming out about it, I could add to my voice to the list. If my voice had any power at all, then that could only be a good thing. Mm. Also, because I wasn't the typical um, stereotype of you know, an autistic man doing maths or science, I felt like that could help break the stigmatism. Mm. Um, you know, I used to model, that's not something think people think about in, in terms of, you know, of, of all autistic people. Um, and it's, I think it, I thought there was more benefit to me talking out and that therefore I would accept whatever the negative, and there is negativity. You get mm. trolls, you get abuse, you get dumped on dates, <laughs> you get, you know, it, it, it is, there's negativity. Um, but for me, it was worth it. However, I think that everybody has to make their own decision and it's a big decision to make. Yeah, mm. it's a lot when you're on BBC radio and you're there to talk about your work and someone says, asks a very deeply traumatic question mm. live on air and suddenly you're like, oh, this thing that was so secret for so long, and mine was secret, mm. is now pub it's on Wikipedia. And that's, that's mm. quite a lot to deal with. Mm. And you don't realize how much until you're in it. So I would always say to young autistic writers, I'd be like, write with your voice and, and say everything you want to say, but don't feel you have to. You don't have to use your identity to get, you know, your career going it's mm. it's your allowed privacy i feel really strongly about this yeah. so i'm going to be quiet no, but they <laughs> dig they dig for it though and that's yeah. the thing is that people feel vital but also not only are you female authors which men don't get called male authors <laughs> but you're female autistic authors and you get another thing but i i always think the more we talk about this stuff the more people do reveal themselves to be whoever they are 
the less of a stigma. And the people that can talk about it, the the, mo- the more it changes the world for people that are can't talk about it. Yes, mm. yeah. So y- for me, you kind of work out: am I am I in a position of of, of privilege essentially that I I could talk about it and not have my career affected? Mm. I mean, maybe it has been, but I haven't found out yet. So <laughs> we will find out. Um, but, you know, I, I was in a position of entitlement and privilege in that I would not be directly affected, whereas there are people out there who, if they come out, will be fired yeah. or lose their, you know, lose their, rela- whatever it is, they will, mm. their life will be detrimentally affected. So I think it's, as with anything, if you have the ability and the power to make a change for those who can't do anything, then that's always a good place to start. So and I think that's probably the most amazing place to leave it as well. <laughs> I want to thank the most amazing people that we've all ever met, and I really, I just love you three. Elle McNichol, <laughs> Abigail Bell, <laughs> and Holly Smell. Clapping thank you up. so much, and thank you to <laughs> for coming. It's been lovely. Oh, Books and are available downstairs. Thank by you to Sean as well. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Everyone, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Books are available to sign, um, and they're on the first floor near the first escalators that you get. There's yeah. a big bookshop thing. And we'll also sign books that you haven't bought, and they're <laughs> yeah. with you, not yeah. with you by new Yeah, ones. so that's going to happen in probably five minutes. I don't know that practical bit, but soon. Yeah. Thank yeah. you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.